He's a retired Philadelphia police captain who's earned the ire of many of his former colleagues. He's actually been arrested for protesting with Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> and yesterday he was marching in Philadelphia in a protest against abusive policing. Captain Lewis will be speaking on the demilitarization of police training. Please welcome Captain Lewis. Hello everyone, I want to thank uh, the people who were responsible for me showing up here today. I was quite surprised, shocked really, uh, due to my reputation. <laughs> I, I really didn't think they'd want somebody as controversial as me here. Uh, briefly, I spent 24 years in the Philadelphia Police Department. I retired. I was very upset with the way things were, both in my neighborhood. I was president of the Civic Association. Nobody gave a damn. Uh, I was president for 17 years, and the only reason I was president of the Civic Association, nobody else wanted to do it. And so that, that bothered me. Things, a number of things bothered me. So I went up to the Catskill Mountains, uh, 191 acres, an old farm, and lived a uh, very Walden-esque lifestyle for eight years and was quite happy. Uh, 2,500 square foot organic garden. I harvested my own uh, uh, heat from wood in my woodlands and uh, chickens, eggs, goats, you name it, for eight years. Loved it. I was on the internet because I read my news, I do not watch it. And I read something about the Occupy movement. Occupy movement, what is this? They're sleeping on concrete, cement, uh, and all kinds of weather, not good sanitary conditions. So it really piqued my interest. I started to read about it. And contrary to popular belief, they did have demands. They put out a declaration of the occupation on September 29th, 2011. December, I'm sorry, September 29th. That was 12 days after they started the Occupy. With all that confusion, with all that hustle and bustle, they still got out this declaration. I read it. It was 23 bullet points. Every single bullet point I agreed with. They're like, yeah, I agree with that one. Oh, they're right on here. Oh, yeah. Every one. Uh, they all had to do with uh, corporate corruption, corporate greed, how corporations are destroying our environment, how they're destroying our lives, how they control us, how they're totally, totally greedy, and they don't care what they have to do to make more money. Let's look, look at it this way. You're a billionaire, and you still get up every day, and you exploit people to make more money. That's a sociopath. Those people should not have power of us. So this is what motivated me to come out of there. I rented a room in Harlem, it was the cheapest room I could get in New York City, very expensive as you all know. I, I gave a month's uh, payment. I was only going to you know, contribute a month uh, while well, I'm still active, three and a half years later in uh, activism. Okay, now there was a little mistake here. Uh, I will be talking about recruitment and training, not demilitarization, okay? Uh, recruitment. The, the biggest, most important step in having the police department the way you want it is that moment, your per qualifications of a person, and saying, yes, we will accept that person. Or no, we're not going to accept that person. Okay, uh, so that moment in time, that's when you have to make the right decision because you're going to live with that decision for 20 more, twenty or plus years, because that officer is going to be around a long time. It is incredibly difficult to fire an officer, almost impossible. So you better make that right decision right then and there. There's a multitude of different tests, battery of tests that uh, officers, uh, recruits go through. Uh, there's even, they take x-rays of your spine to make sure that you don't have an irregularity that's going to result in a back problem later on. My brother was eliminated over that, and he played four years of college football, okay, but yet that, that little kink in his, his spine, they eliminate him. They do a test, <coughs> they do every employer you have. Uh, they do a uh, health test, heart test, you name it. They do um, the polygraph test, where they ask you anything and everything. For instance, Mr. Lewis, when you were here, you're here today, was there any question that you wanted us, you were hoping that we would not ask you. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question is, 
Mr. Lewis, what would you say is the one thing that you are most ashamed of in life? Mm. Not comfortable questions. Okay? And that knocks a lot of people out. But they also realize nobody's an angel. Okay? Let's, let's get that clear. Or they, they'd have nobody in there. But here's what I'm saying here. A test even more important than that is a test with the acronym of MMPI. Mm. Anybody know what that stands for? Minnesota okay. Fancy. It stands for the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Test. Multiphasic. Multiple aspects of a person's first a personality. This is not an intelligence test. That's also included but the, uh, in the uh, uh, recruitment stage, but this is, has nothing to do with that. It's about your personality types. One of the major things they look at is your level of sensitivity, compassion, empathy. Now you may say, oh wow, they really value that, huh? That's great that they value that. No. <laughs> if you score too high in sensitivity, compassion, or empathy, out the door. And there's there are primarily two reasons for this. Number one is they're still under this John Wayne myth. And they want to be. A lot of your, your people, uh, your police commanders involved with this recruitment, they want to be thought of as John Wayne the type. They want to be the rough, the rugged type of guy. And so they make sure that that personality test gets rid of, quote, the wimps. The other thing is your, your city government, what they do here is they make a mistake. It's what I call uh, penny wise and dollar foolish. They think that if they hire the sensitive, empathetic officer, that after a couple months out on the job, they're not going to be able to handle it. There's too much blood, too much guts, too much, it's just too depressing uh, what they encounter. And this is, I'm talking about city, okay? Not suburban, not rural, city. Especially inner city. That's where I spent 19 of my 24 years, uh, inner city. So they think, you know what, we wasted thousands of dollars on this officer, and now they're quitting because they just were not hard enough. Pennywise dollar foolish, okay? Because now the hard officer you're keeping uh, hey, that doesn't matter for me. I don't care the blood and guts. I don't care about the little child starving and the conditions. Uh, well, they, not that they don't care, but it doesn't bother them enough to quit. This is the same person that is going to be brutal and going to result in million dollar lawsuits that your, the township is going to lose, the city is going to lose. Penny wise, dollar foolish. Don't ever think you're saving money by uh, a few more people not quitting after they were trained at the police department. It's a fallacy. The other thing is, when I was getting one, they gave veterans 10 extra points. The scores, there were several thousand uh, that took the test. It's so close that the scores are like uh, 92.50. The next one down is 92.48. That's how close the competition is. Because they also take in, involve uh, your education, age, things of that nature, but veterans got 10 extra points. 10! So they automatically were the first 100 or 200 recruits. I don't know if you want veterans on the police force. Alright? <laughs> I'm not saying all. I'm, I'm saying... Let me, let me retract that. Yeah. I don't want to give 10 points to the veterans. Okay? It's, it's a nice idea. But they're coming out battle tested, which some John Wayne type like. Yeah, he's battle tested. Uh, he's hardened to some really tough situations, and he may even be suffering from uh, PTSD. None of these. Anyway. So many more. I have run into so many people and friends who are suffering from it, but they never went public for it. They never wanted to admit it, but they're suffering. Uh, so I. It's a fine idea to help out the vets, but not at the expense of your police department. You don't, a police department should not be involved in helping out vets. All right, uh, now the other thing, the other way it's really detrimental to a society, a community, tough, harder individual cops, is involved in community relations. Community relations is of utmost importance you have to have the respect of your community. No ifs, ands, or buts. They have to feel safe with you. Officer friendly, you've got to bring back. Officer friendly is dead, by the way, all right, in many urban areas. 
They don't even know who Officer Friendly is anymore. You've got to bring back that. Children have got to look up to police officers, feel safe with police officers. Adults have to feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a real quick example, just a simple thing like stopping you for going, going through a red light. I know what we did in Philadelphia. I was in on enough of them, a backup, and I fell prey to it also sometimes. And uh, that's another subject, how to get out of that uh, routine of being hard. Uh, you, somebody stops, you come up, and you say, driver's license, registration, and insurance. <coughs> I, I heard that so many times. And, and now you're, you're the driver. Another officer comes up to you and says, hello, I'm Officer Lewis. You went through that red light back there. May I please see your driver's license, your registration, and your insurance card. Thank you. Totally different amount of respect. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you, you're going to run into a lot less confrontations with that. Mm -hmm. I always, two things, a cop will not, usually, they will not identify themselves, and when they go up to you, they don't tell you why they were stopped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just respect, to tell somebody why they were stopped. And the driver will say, uh, excuse me, officer, but why was I stopped? I said driver's license, registration, and insurance. They hate to be questioned. That's that John Wayne. Okay, you don't want that. I've seen it, I've heard it. That they immediately take offense that you're questioning them. They shouldn't have to question you. You should be telling them. So in, in community relations, the hard John Wayne type destroys community relations. Respect is so, so important. Okay, now obviously there's a lot more to go into recruitment, but I only have 10 minutes, so... Well, 10 I, minutes is almost up. <laughs> oh, wow, okay, wow. Quick on training. FBI, did, I did some research. FBI has some uh, information here. I'm gonna have my iPad over there, and uh, please feel free to look at it. The amount of training on different subjects, overwhelmingly, the amount of training on firearms and physical defense or attacks is, takes precedent over everything else, overwhelmingly. What are you, two things wrong here. Number one, you're wasting a lot of time that could be uh, training officers in other areas where they should be trained. Number two, it's giving the officers the idea, ah, oh, this is a brutal job, shooting and beating. That's what this job is about, because it's totally stressed. Overwhelmingly, in the police academy, that's what this job is about. No. You know what the two smallest uh, areas are in hours spent? Stress management, which cops need tremendously. All those videos you see there of beatings and whatnot, those cops are burnt out. Not only, number one, they were hired for the wrong reason, because of the John Wayne syndrome. Number two, they're burnt out. They are burnt out. No stress management. The other thing that's uh, major was health and fitness. They stressed health and fitness, 46 hours and, and what? Health and fitness? By the time you're a cop, believe me, your fitness and your health um, is set in your mind. If you don't exercise before your cop, you're not going to exercise. If you don't eat healthy before your cop, you're not going to eat health cop. Complete waste of time, all those hours on that. You should have a training officer. When I got, came out of the academy, they put me with a, a regular officer who trained me. This officer was a drinker, a womanizer, a gambler, he was brutal, he was a thief, all on the job. All right. That who, who's trained, you have to have a position of a training officer, they get paid a little bit more extra. Now, last thing, you have to have input. Do not, you have to have in your mind, this is your police department. It is not the police department of the police chief or the police commissioner. Do not be intimidated. You have a right as a group to go and say, I want to see how you use the MM, MMPI. Do you take sensitive people off of there? You, what's their training? You have a right to ask all these questions. It is your police department. It is not their police department. Get that in your mind. Okay, thank you. Questions for Captain Lewis? Uh, yeah. uh, do you think that uh, officer safety is overemphasized in the modern police departments? Yes, because what they do is, uh, first, that's another thing. It is not the cops and robbers you see on TV. And all this officer safety, we gotta shoot, 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 because these people are all trying to kill you? No. Police work is 95% social work. Believe me. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that they did very little training of, the lowest was dispute mediation. <laughs> and I, I will show you this. I, I will open up my iPad over there for you to see. 
the, the hours spent on different types of training. Mm -hmm. No, you pick. Maybe. Would you feel comfortable commenting on um, civilians using the iPhone, you know, from a distance to film? Oh, absolutely. You, you definitely uh, have to record the police actions. And my thing was, the good cops will love being recorded. And, but they have to be praised. They have to get recognition for handling the job professionally. You just cannot punish the, the bad guys, the bad uh, behavior. I took great pride in looking for officers doing things right. That's just as important as catching officers doing things wrong. Okay, English police generally don't carry guns. How do you feel about you know, the fact that just every policeman that we have carries a gun? Uh, right now, the environment, uh, I would be hesitant to have officers out there without guns. I think this environment is quite different than over there. Right. Yeah, last time I checked stats, we had more cops dying of stress-related illnesses and casualties in the line of duty, and an equivalent population of cops who eat their own guns that get shot by other people. What are the stats today? Is that consistent uh, with your own? I have no idea, but that is a very important part because it right, goes right back to no stress training and no counseling available. They have counseling available, I'm sorry. They do, but no cops going to go there. They're afraid of what other cops will think if they find out. They're afraid of the counselors talking about them. I am in favor of mandatory counseling. Whether it be every six, every six months, an officer should be sent, sent to mandatory counseling. And therefore, they can't talk about anybody because everybody's going to counseling. And then behind that closed door, you can say whatever you want. They need training. They need to talk to people because it will make you hard. Even if you get on their sensitive. I was not the same person after a year. That's how the job in an inner city. In an inner city. With your trainer. With your trainer, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good point. But no, it was just it's the nature of the job. The nature of the job I in an inner I city. Need. And also, before I leave, uh, starting in Occupy, I got a very threatening letter from Philadelphia Police Commissioner Ramsey. Take one over there where he could I could have charged him with harassment and threats. He said he would take any and all necessary action to stop me, and what I was doing was perfectly legal. I called his bluff, he backed down. But he never should have made that threat in the first place. He was willing to deny me my constitutional rights. I called his bluff, the, the uh, union head, John McNesby, he threatened my pension. To take away my pension, that's the second letter. I called his bluff. City policy, you cannot take away an officer's pension for doing what I did, and he knew it. But these two people were willing to violate my rights to stop me. All righty, so take one of each over there, and I'll have my iPad open to the FBI statistics on how many hours training uh, that I, I discovered here before I came here for you to review. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have a few words for us? Okay, well, I really... I'm sorry for Bob with the sword. This, this is actually a collective, a democracy unplugged, maybe like an anarchist collective. Of, <laughs> so, I'd also like to point out Darren, Roger, Owen, uh, Bill, and Bill. Okay, and... Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank my wife, who also helped with things. And I'd like to have a round of applause for <clears throat> the people who uh, spoke and gave of their time. <laughs> oh, and lastly, if anyone's interested in working with our volunteer group of Democracy Unplugged, please see one of us afterwards. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.